Okay. This is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 20th of August, 2004, approximately 10.30 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Maurice D. Morley, born in the city of Saratoga. I was only there for three days, and the rest of my life was in the village of Balsam until they took me into the service. Okay. Uh, when were you born? Oh, in 1922, April oh. 21st. All right. Um, what was your educational background when you, prior to entering service? Well, I hadn't quite finished high school, and I got excited and joined the service. Okay. Do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I do. I was with a girlfriend. We were at the Methodist Church. Uh, they had an organization, even though I didn't belong to the church, I went with this girl, and uh, it was announced there. It was like a, um, a club mm -hmm. they had, and uh, it was announced there about Pearl Harbor. What was your feeling when you heard that? To be honest with you, I was mad. Mm -hmm. For They'd done that to us. So I decided then that I'd try to get in the service. Okay, so you enlisted. Why did you select the Marine Corps? Well, quite a few of my friends had joined the Marine Corps from Boston. They had one great recruiter there. <laughs> uh, they even named a road after him, and his name slips my mind. In the town of Malta, there's a road named after him. Really? Yes. All right. Uh, so when did you enlist? Jeez. Well, you wrote down uh, September of 42. I know you wrote down that you enlisted in September of 42. Okay. Um, where did you go for your basic training? I went to Paris Island mm -hmm. as a boot. Could you tell us about your training there? Well, we went, uh, we went to a little town, got off. We went down by train. And uh, I don't know where they got the car they put us in. It must have been from the early western days. It was brutal. Oh, this way for the Marines going. Uh, so anyway, to make the story short, uh, we landed in this place and everybody's writing a postcard and there's quite a few uh, colored boys around. And for a quarter they make sure your paper stuff got mailed. So we all sent cards back, we arrived. And then we went over across the bridge, over into the Marine Corps base. And then we were, learned how to be a jarhead. <laughs> <laughs> we, okay, how long were you uh, there? Uh, oh, well, I, I can't remember the exactly how long, Okay. It, but uh, we went through learning yes and no sir and stand at attention and do some drill, do your own washing and a lot of, for a lot of them were from, didn't know or never had to be, do their own work. Mm -hmm. And then they sent us to the rifle range, we were there for a week and they issued us the bold action rifle. And you could, so they allowed, if you had classes and you fired for record. And I didn't make the greatest shot. I was trying like the devil. And if you wanted to in the afternoon, you could go draw extra ammunition and go out to the range and fire. A thousand yards is quite a ways. <laughs> you had your sight up. And then you polished your rifle. I swear my rifle, the sight was something wrong with it, <laughs> but maybe I'm... So anyway, then we done a lot of drilling, and I'll never forget, 
when they issued us our boom dikers, <laughs> the first thing we done was the our drills instructor told you, if you're smart, you'll get your bucket full, full of water and stand in it with your shoes in. And we did. And believe it or not, they sort of shaped to your foot just nice. Hey, when I wore them out, I hated it because I, well, anyway, it was quite an experience. We had mess duty, and you wouldn't believe the mess duty. We'd have to get up <clears throat> about 3 o'clock in the morning, and they'd come around and call you and take you down to the mess hall. And we'd stand outside and we'd have fire hoses. they turn the lights on and the wall would be covered with bugs. And you wash them down. And you wouldn't believe that. And, oh, and when we, part of the island was like jungle warfare. <laughs> they had pigs running through, take care of the snakes. That's what they told us anyway. <laughs> And our drill instructor f made a mistake. He was drilling us, and we were drilling on this boat pier. <laughs> he forgot to, to holler about face, and about eight or ten of the front rank went into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it hurt me any. I survived. Now, how old were you when you went to Paris Island? Oh, jeez. 22, must have been 20 years old. Then. Was yes. this the first time you were away from home? Uh, you want to know the truth? Except when I was a Boy Scout, I traveled a little with the Boy Scouts. So were you homesick at all? Uh, well, I sort of missed the girlfriend uh -huh. <laughs> at that age. But uh, no, it didn't bother me that much, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Did you write a lot of letters home? Uh, a few, not uh -huh. a huge amount. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, that's about the basic training. One dark night, they uh, called uh, us out. And of course, we lived in Quonset huts. And when you fell out, you fell out with a pith helmet on and your rifle. And you better be out there in a hurry. And this night, he hollered. All out, and some, the first or second man got his rifle across the doorway, and everybody's rushing, and that poor fellow ended up with a few broken ribs when everybody slammed into him with a rifle across the door. Well, let's see, what else? Oh, and we had to learn how to waterproof our boots after we soaked them in water and got them to shape and wash your own clothes. And one night somebody was too loud in the barracks and our drill instructor had come down. He said, all right, uh, stand at attention to your bunks and everybody jumped up and stood. Get your bucket, yes sir. Okay, take everything out of your bucket. You had your washing gear in it. I'll never forget that, we took it out once he went. All right, now put the bucket on your head. <laughs> Okay, forward march, left flank, right flank, rear march, and you didn't dare to lift the bucket up. <laughs> now I think you guys will go to sleep tonight. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> but that stuck in my mind. If that's what you want to know what it was like for me. Mm -hmm. And then we, we had graduation. Yeah, big deal. We knew how to say yes sir, no sir, and turn right and turn left. And uh, had graduation, and that night they fell us all out, and the, uh, an officer went down, you, 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 stand over there. You, you, stand over there. And I think he picked out three groups. He says, okay, the rest of you back to the barracks. He says, you three go pack your gear. So we went and packed our gear. And they put us on a bus, and I ended up in Norfolk. They sent me to sea school. And I said to myself, 
I wanted to go to sea, I had to join the Navy. <laughs> Nothing against the Navy, but here I am. And they told us we're going aboard an aircraft carrier. Well, believe it or not, the aircraft carrier wasn't finished. So we went to sea school. And that was quite a thing. You guarded buildings. We had a colonel that I think is pretty sure his name was Hanley. And he was tough. He was a little short guy. When you're doing guard duty, they said, you want to look out. He carries a BB gun. And if you ain't marching right or doing right, you'll know it. <laughs> but believe it or not, that hunk of ground there was not in the United States, according to the Marine Corps. They had a gate down there. They had a 30 caliber machine gun mounted on the guard shack roof. And they had several guards with live ammunition. And they had this big gate. I'll never forget the night. Somebody got in trouble over in Norfolk and he run back, come across the ferry and got inside the barracks and the cops were chasing him. Got inside the gate. And the cops made a mistake. They come through that gate. When they heard them rifle bolts click, they told to stop. And they had to put their hands in the air, and the sergeant of the guard marched them right up to the main barracks, and Hanley was there, and he says, you know better than to come in on my property. <laughs> I was there, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so anyway, he, he says, you go out and wait outside. He, I told you, you wait outside the gate. So they took him out. The guy to run in they had, they put four Marines with fixed bayonets and they marched them down and they closed the big gates that cars could come in and opened the little man gate and they marched him right out. And Hanley says, there he is. Now you can do him, but you don't come in on my property. I'll never... So anyway, after we went to sea school, we learned about weapons and five-inch guns and 40 millimeter and 20 millimeters, and then we went up to their range and we fired. And then, let's see, we went back, and then we put us aboard the ship, and the ship wasn't finished, and it was getting cold, believe it or not. No heat, no nothing, and the ship was in the dry dock. The USS Essex, I guess it'll live with me till I die, but... We went aboard, and the thing that struck me is the flight deck was made of wood. Down below was the hangar deck, and the hangar deck, I swear, had armor plate and must have been a foot and a half thick. So you go down the hatches, and we were lucky. They had the Marines, two squads of us, two platoons plus two officers and a major and a gunnery sergeant and a first sergeant and each platoon had their platoon sergeants and regular sergeants. They put us between the officers country and the sailors. We had this compartment and we had rifle racks all the way around. I'll tell you about them. I got in trouble with them. <laughs> Now, what was your job? Were you, like, security, or...? Uh, well, we started out as security, yes. We guarded the caissons because it was in dry dock, mm -hmm. and there uh, was no water and under it, and they were afraid something happened to caissons, and we'd be in bad trouble. So we guarded that. We guarded the gangplank. We started out as uh, doing whatever they wanted you know, uh, like officers, messengers, salute to your arm broke off, polish your shoes, and we got ashore once in a while, which was nice. And, uh, well, anyway, I ended up as a captain's orderly. I think the first sergeant was mad at me because the rest could wear dungarees. We had to pre make sure our khakis were pressed, our shoes were polished, everything was... Every, every third day, 
I was on duty, four on, four off, four on, four off. And then I had a break. And the first captain was Captain Duncan. He was took over command of the ship. And I thought we were never going to get to sea. I'll be honest with you. I, maybe it was, we were aboard maybe a month and a half or two before Oh, and we had a garden under down in the under the ship, so I never seen a forty five holster like that before. It's strapped on the bottom part of your leg, but you had to hooked up on your belt up here, and you walked in under some of them ships like this, humped over, cold. Oh dear! But we made it. I'm still here, so I can't complain. You're asking me what, what I thought. Well, finally, we went to sea, sea trials. We went from here to Trinidad, and we went off the coast of Africa. They didn't tell us exactly how far. And another thing that struck me strange is our binoc the binoculars aboard ship were only 35 millimeter. And I, so I finally asked somebody, and he said, well, when you're out in the ocean, that's all you can see, the earth curves, and that's all you need. So I never, <laughs> that always stuck in my mind. Now well, let's see, we went to sea and then we come back. We got ready to go out and we finally got our, they tested our catapults. They kept firing a uh, four-wheel dolly with huge blocks on it to test the catapults. And our deck at that time was straight. We had two catap or one catapult. Yeah. And so we ended up with twenty millimeters and a forty millimeter. They didn't give us a five inch. We trained on the five inch. <laughs> a waste of time. <laughs> but anyway. And uh I was a loader on a 20. You had 50 rounds of 20 millimeter in a circle drum. We had the forward mount along the flight deck forward on the port side. And we went out and they towed targets and we f fired at them. We were allowed, believe it or not, we were allowed three rounds. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> you got. Anybody that went more than three got in trouble. You had a 50-round drum on the gun. And then, well, see, then we, we spent time loading the drums, getting them straightened out. And then down on the uh, same side, we had the quad 40, four barrels, 40 millimeter. I didn't get put on that. Some of the boys were. Then we went to sea, and then all of a sudden we got told we're shipping out. And then we made it to Panama, and going through the canal, we covered everything up. The planes had to be covered, all the openings so you couldn't see in. And God helped the poor gun machine gunners on one of the canal post. They had a balcony sticking out and they had the 30 caliber mount, mounted up there. Well, one of our radio towers as we were going, being towed through the lock, took the balcony right off. <laughs> Machine gun and all. Them guys just got inside in time. And we got to the other side and I had liberty. And, of course, being a big shot, <laughs> We went in, they had air conditioning in the tavern. Probably a hundred or 150 pound cake of ice and a wash tub with fans blowing across it. It was cool, nice. So, well, what are you gonna have to drink? Well, you know, we're big shots. We should have known better. Uh, rum and Coke, rum and Coke, fine. They brought out glasses about that high and the guy come with a bottle of rum, almost, to the top with rum. One bottle of Coke for about seven drinks. <laughs> well, 
you got one of them in you. <laughs> Come to find out coke is more expensive and rarer down there than rum rust. So anyway, I had one. I said, I think I better get out of here. Walked out and that hot sun hit me. Oh my God, I was a mess. So they had a taxi driver around there. I forget how much it was, 50 cents to take us probably from here uh, to the end of the village here, or the city here. So I give them 50 cents to take me back to where the ship was. And I got there and I see guys selling bananas. I said, the ta what do they get? He says, oh, 50 cents. I said, you want to make a dollar? Here's 50 cents. Go get me a stalk of bananas. And he did. And he come back and I gave him a dollar for getting them for me. And I went aboard carrying the ship and the officer deck took a look, one look at me and I'm trying to salute to him and the aft of the flag, which you're supposed to. And he says, you better get below. And I staggered down, I went down and I hung it up and the guys are all laughing like hanging. I said, you see that big banana? That's mine. You leave it alone you, and you can have any of the rest. So I went in took my clothes off and threw them in the dirty, our, we had a dirty laundry bag and I went in took a shower and I come back I looked up and the big banana was gone. <laughs> well I was just drunk enough. I must have went half nuts. I grabbed that stock of bananas and I started going through that locker room swinging it. Well, two days later <laughs> After the first sergeant went to see me, I had a whole bunch of M1s to clean and polish because I hit them with bananas as I went swinging. And I was on the, the you know what list I'm talking about. <laughs> I was on the list from then on. Oh, uh, well. I say, I spent a lot of time forward up in the, I found a catwalk that went across this way, across from port to starboard. And I used to lay up there because if you hung around the compartment, you got a lot of extra work to do. The smartest thing was to get out of there. Then I went and I had a mess cook. And in the Marines, you do, what was it, a month of mess cooking. So I was down there, and believe it or not, I think I've made more coffee than any man I know of. Believe it or not, we used a quarter of a ton of coffee a day aboard the ship. My job was to grind, shovel them into the copper, grind the beans, and they had a scale in under, and they put them in these bags, put the bag up, and look out, and we made 80 gallons of coffee at a time. Port and starboard, because the mess hall had two walkways. My job was to make sure that was always one of those coppers was always had coffee. And coffee cups, nobody had a standard coffee cup. They had bowls, they had everything you can think of. Imagine a quarter of a ton of coffee a day I ground for 30 days. While I was doing that, we are out sea, and a destroyer come alongside and they're putting a man aboard with a Beecher's boy. Mm -hmm. And he was a chief. Or he wasn't a chief then, he was first class. His name was Van Wart. And he come aboard in his duffel bag, they dropped it, and it broke one of his plates, Paul's teeth plate. He'd been in the Navy quite a while. In fact, he even was up with Admiral Byrd one time. So anyway, he couldn't eat much, so he was come down. He's sort of hungry. I had to, seeing I was a coffee maker, I had look, I could run in and out of the, the galley. So I took care of him, and he never forgot it. He become the captain's, what is known as his left hand. He become, they made him a chief, and he was head of security aboard the ship chief master at arms. He had a cabin better than most officers, believe it or not, in the middle of the ship. And he never forgot. 
And the first sergeant, every time he see me, you chip paint, okay. Go, buddy. I, I swear, like that wall over there, you chipped it today. Next week you painted it. Three weeks later, you're chipping it again. Anything to keep you busy. So when we were in Panama, I bought a case, and we had it hidden. Good thing we didn't have to use that last case of 40 millimeters. <laughs> we had uh, Kool-Aid lemon. You take put two packages of lemon Kool-Aid in, in your wash bucket, and do the deck, and it eats the haze of rust off, believe it or not. So we always were getting a good, somebody tipped me off on it, and everybody, I could have sold that stuff for a million dollars out to sea, but we always got top when they inspected, the inspection come. And you had steel walkways where you walked, and the rest of the floor and under the bunks were painted, and your bunks were fixed so that they swung up and made bigger room, and there were four high. God help the guy that had the bottom bunk. He always had dirty sheets. <laughs> Everybody had to climb up to get into their bunk. Well, then I have to do duty on the stand in front of the. If, if we were in port, you stood in front of his port cabin. He had a beautiful, the captain did, he had a beautiful setting room, a special bedroom, and his own bedroom, and he had his own galley with a, a, a Filipino, at that time, cook. And we got to be pretty good friends because you're standing out in front of his door, some officer come up, I'd like to see Captain Duncan. Yeah, and the toughest thing I had to do is learn to talk third person, believe it or not. I'll see if the captain won. I go in, sir, do you think Captain Duncan would like to see Commander such and such? All right. Aye, aye, sir. And I go out. The, the captain will now see you, sir, and let him in. You wore a forty-five. You stood there like a dummy. At night, if you had the night shift, they were kind enough, they gave you a chair you could sit in on your night shift while the captain was sleeping. But old Captain Duncan, he got up about 3 o'clock in the morning, so the chair better disappear. I'm not saying, that was, uh, the only thing I have against the Navy is, I'll tell you that a little later, they have a class system. To me, it wasn't right. And they can say what they wanted, but one lady I've always had a lot of respect for, for one thing she done, Eleanor Roosevelt. She changed the rule. Aboard ship, the Navy, if you were colored or a Filipino, you didn't have a rank. You couldn't have any rank. You were just a messman. And she changed the rule. And we had the first rated colored electrician in the Navy come aboard our ship. He was first class. From then on, they could get ranks. They were known as seamen and everything else, not just messmen, which I thought was quite a thing. They, were, they bled just like we did. Well, talk about bleeding. I've seen torpedoes come so close to our ship that I couldn't believe it. I'm looking over the side, and, and I'll tell you, I think I wet my pants when I hanging over the side and watch it run down the side. And we had been hit with a kamikaze. He took out of some of our gun mounts in the flight deck. Now, from reading your form, you received a bronze star for that. Well, Could you tell us? Oh, oh, well, that was uh, when we got hit forward. I was up in the forward 20 millimeters, and as I was going down, we were arming our, ship, our airplanes with torpedoes. 
in bombs. Well, as they come down the ladder, there they were. Well, there was a gas main that was broke off and it was burning. So I grabbed the fire extinguishers. I don't know why, I just happened to do it. I'd done the right thing. And I'm standing, gasoline's on the deck, and I'm keeping it away from the torpedoes. And another got another fellow that got hit with shrapnel, he was throwing me extinguishers. And we held the fire back until we could get the pumping system working, what we call the, uh, like the fire screens. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't believe. They were nothing but fire nozzles across the deck. They were one of our secrets when we went through the canals. If you tried to get through them, you ended up on your belly. They'd knock you down. They were so strong. The water curtains, they called them. Till they got them pumping, I held the held the f fire away from the torpedoes, and I went on. I never said a word about it. Some officer seen it, and he put me in for the Bronze Star. And was this off uh, Okinawa that you were hit, or? Uh, I got it listed there. Mm -hmm. I can't swear to you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, I'm, I guess I'm not much help for no, you. No, you are. You're telling some great things. Well, um, how did you like taking showers on uh, Carrier? Uh, we, believe it or not, we had fresh water showers until some of the other, a uh, couple of ships got hit and we had to give them fresh water. So we had another bar of soap known as salt water soap. It lathered, believe it or not, man. And uh, you were allowed just so much fresh water, so you used salt water to get all lathered up. One, two, three, four, five, hope you got it all rest off of it, didn't it? It was like, <laughs> well, you ever have wax on your hands from wax and something? Yeah. That, you know, it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> you better get it, make sure you got it out of your hair. <laughs> oh, you want to hear some funny things? Sure. I thought it was funny, okay. We had, our toilets had no doors on them. It was a long trough with the side dividers and the wooden seats, two seats, or two pieces to each seat. And the trough went this way down and it dumped out in the ocean and run salt water. Well, we had some wise guy got up in the fire end and he wadded up a whole bunch of toilet paper, got it off, stuck a match on it, and dropped it in the trough, and it went down, and you should see, hear guys screaming all the way down. <laughs> there they're sitting, and bang! <laughs> oh. I couldn't figure why that guy run, so <laughs> the young guy would disappear. Oh, if they had caught him, they'd probably kill him. <laughs> but it would become one of the laughs of the ship. And another thing is, our trademark when we were in it, going into battles, we hoped somebody had appendicitis. For every bat, big battle we were in, major battle, somebody had an appendicitis attack before we went in. And they announced it over the PA system. And then we had, we had a marine bugler that stood on the bridge quite a bit, and he also learned how to use a Boltzmann's pipe. So he'd double on that. We always knew when we were get better get your fanny in gear if you heard the Boltzmann pipe and it go. He had a little twill to it, sort of warned us. And you'd see the Marines running to their gun mounts ahead of time. But then the, the general alarm would go off. You'd hate to hear that too. But according to the records, Anybody who was aboard the Essex could wear 13 battle stars. We were in 13 major battles, and one of the worst ones, or the biggest fear I ever had, was when we were in the China Seas. That also, I couldn't believe. We made a run from Hong Kong to Saigon. We bombed the Royal Tankers up there, 
And thank God the wind was in the right direction when we were coming out. We didn't have to turn into the wind to launch our planes. And we're running out, and they're on our tail. They, we, I figured we, they had us for good. Well, we launched our planes, and we made it out. And two days later, I never see so many people with earrings on my life, sailors. And, of course, I was a joker. I had a big brass ring, and the Major had us all down in our compartment, in the little compartment walkway from the first sergeant's office. And if I see anybody wearing an earring, I'll get a hold of it, and I don't care if part of the ear comes off or not. Can you hear me? And that's final. I don't care what those sa sailors do. That's their business. Yes, sir. And he went, and I took this brass one out, and I stuck it in my nose. <laughs> and, you know, they go. All of a sudden, the hand came over my nose and snapped it out. And it was just enough pressure to cut the skin on my nose and the blood run out. And he said, and that goes for in the nose, too, you wise guy. <laughs> so you know what happened to me? I had to polish decks and stuff. <laughs> Well, I don't think he had a sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, what, what were meals like on the Essex? <clears throat> uh, not bad until towards the end. We were, we were needed so bad we couldn't... The Essex, an aircraft carries nothing but a supply ship, to be honest with you. They carry, we carried roughly a hundred airplanes. Bombers, uh, two placers, and fighters. We had four night fighters. And, well, I'll tell you about the night fighters right now. They launched them. They had big bubbles on their wings. And one night we launched them, and they got orders. We won't turn the landing lights back on unless you get that bogey. And they went out. Well... We lost one night fighter. One of them got the bogey, and when he come back, I can remember that. We carried four, and they only launched two. And you'd be surprised how many pilots we lost when they couldn't get enough to get off the ship, really. And then another thing, we had air bedding every now and then. You bring it up top side. You're supposed to tie it on the handrails, make sure it's fast and good. And every now and then they'd rev up, have the planes parked at the aft of the ship, getting ready to launch, and they'd start all the propellers. You talk about a snowstorm one day. One of them mattresses got loose and got into those propellers, and you should have seen the mess of me. <laughs> <coughs> of course, at that time, we had a new, new captain. Duncan was relieved, and Captain Oste come aboard. And he, Duncan was a, been brought up among the ships. Oste was a pilot. He knew. <coughs> So it made a big difference, too. And nothing against Captain Duncan, but uh, I'm just saying that mm -hmm. uh, he understood the pilots more and their problems and everything. He also had his wings on, so that made a difference, too. And then I got the guard for him. He had a 38 shoulder holster, and I had a 45. I used to have to wear carry his 38 shoulder holster with me whenever things went. And if you were on duty when the general alarm went off, didn't matter how many hours it was, you stayed there. It, and I got caught a couple of times. And at sea, you wouldn't believe, For he had a beautiful, non, or his regular cabin down below. He didn't live in it. He lived in a room smaller than this. It had a bunk and a walkway and it had a toilet. But the toilet was also a seat, a chair. And on the wall, a table come down 
and that was his desk, and there was his bunk. And it wasn't, I wouldn't say he's just about the width of that one square there that you have, and the full length of a bunk, about ten foot. I couldn't believe that was his sea cabin. And when we were at sea, that's where he lived. And his, his cook would bring up his food to him up there. And we stood out in front of his door. And there was one officer, if I ever found him today, I'm carrying a cane, I'd wrap him right side the head. I'd spend hours polishing my shoes, spit shine, to get a good shine. Now they got shoes that shine automatically, but we didn't, we had to polish them. He managed to step on my shoe every time I was on duty. Well, anyway, so I'm standing up there, and we went into one battle, and I wished I had my diary. I made a mistake. I loaned it, and the kids never brought it back to the Balsam School. But anyway, I was standing there. I have been on with them for about six hours, and things had calmed down. And he says, I'm, he's turned to me, and he says, I'm going into my cabin and lay down. Anything happens, you make sure I'm up. Aye, aye, sir. He looked at me, and in the wheelhouse, they had bench, but it had seats that pulled out, round seats. He said to me, you go sit there. Thank you, sir. Jeez, my legs were killing me. I went over and pulled it out, and I sat down, and this officer's named Glassman. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? The captain just about closed the door, he opened up. He says, it's all right, Mr. Glassman. I told him to sit there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, geez. That done my heart good. <laughs> I was only a peon. Well, anyway. I ended up, when he left, he made Admiral, and he was on there for a few days. He was going to leave, and he was going to take his staff with him. They need them someplace in a rush, and he had to fly off. There's no way he could take us. He flew off in a two-seater. And I'll never forget, he come and shook my hand. I was only a, a peon. And he shook all his orderly's hands. And I got his picture there. He was a great man for my money. When he left and he become a, he was an admiral, one star. I don't know what happened after that. Because it was not very long the war was ended. And we went back. We were right up we've been dropped when they dropped the atom bomb, we were up at the other end of Japan bombing some of their bases up there. Then we got... What was your reaction when you heard about the dropping of the atomic bombs? Thank God. We had... The head admiral says, I'll take ten of these carriers in and the, and the fleet right into the Tokyo Harbor and we'll... I'll bring at least three of them back. <laughs> Which three? <laughs> yeah, I'll admit I was scared. Who wouldn't be? Somebody's trying to... Eat. But I had... You hear these guys say, well, you had it easy, you were aboard the ship. Well, yes. How far can you swim? I'd be lucky to swim a mile. Yeah, oh, I have it here, I have a shark knife that they issued us. What the hell would you... After I got home and started thinking, what the hell good would that be? I wouldn't even be able to kill a shark with it anyway. I better throw it away. It would weigh me down, but I saved it. <laughs> and some of the carriers went down. And some of the other ships went down. Look how many hundreds died at one shot. I know. And you know what I learned about the Marine Corps? You say, yes, sir. And they say, you go there, yes, sir, and you go. You have no choice or nothing else. 
Well, that's about the best I can tell you. And there's pictures I have and everything of the ship. Okay, why don't you show us what you have? No. My, I'll show you my famous shark knife. <laughs> well, that was made in Cattaraugus works, okay. Now, did you put the star on here? Yes. Because mm -hmm. saying I'm going to be the Admiral's one, <laughs> he got one star. His orderly took one star. And here's our, we were allowed patches, mm -hmm. and this shows that we were sea going. Oh, you had it easy, you were sea going. Yes, I had it easy. I went right where they told me. Here's pictures. Here, if you uh, hold this in front of you and tell what it is, Wayne can focus on it. Here are a few reasons why we're going to stop on Oklahoma. Notice the caves and pits dug in along the hillsides. They're official photos. When he left, I grabbed what I could, I'll be honest with you. Okay. Oh, and here's our torpedo bombers. And there's Mount Fujiyama in the background. Now I noticed in uh, some okay. of the articles you have here, Got it. was the was that David McDonald on your ship? That ace? Yes, it was. Did you uh, know him at all, or I seen him when he could come to the captain's mm -hmm. place. And there's Captain Us, he made Admiral. Okay. Well, I don't know what else you know. Oh, and now the war is over. And here you see a parachute. And there's prisoners in Japan, American prisoners, and we're dropping them supplies, candy, and things that they probably wouldn't have had otherwise. This is from your ship? Yes. It was dropping. Okay. Let's see. Well, I don't want to brag, but... There I am, the Admiral, giving me my medal. That's your bronze star. Yeah. Okay. Believe it or not, I was the only enlisted man at that time to get a medal. <laughs> I don't know. You can take a look and see what else you think is interesting here. Uh, let's see. Now, were you a plank holder on the Essex? Yes, I uh, some place there's a ticket that shows that I plank holder. And when the Admiral left, I become, I went back to the, uh, get reassigned, and the first sergeant was still giving me the business, so I had a chance, I took a chance, and Went down and worked with the Navy as a cook to keep out, and that's how, what I ended up with, being a cook. And there's the chief, Ben Wharton, me on the flight deck. Okay. Saved all these mementos the best I could. You tell me what you think is worth while. Oh, 
are you in this picture at all? No. no. Not too many pictures of it that we got, but there's my plank holders society. Oh. Okay, hold that there and I'll... And that's your ship? Yeah. That's the Essex. Okay, got there, it. There were 16 of them made after ours. You know what happened to the ship? Yes. It served in three wars. Uh-huh. And then it got worn out, and they junked it. It was junked over in Boston. I wanted to get a piece of it and couldn't. Oh, here's maps that the pilots carried in case they got down different islands. So and one is interesting. I know we've seen the European ones. Can you pick it up? These are also, these are made of, what fabric is yep. this? Uh, they probably rayon. Yeah, I think it feels like a... Are they all the yeah. same? Or? No, they're all oh, pointing they are. I know we've seen a lot of the European ones, but uh, not any of the ones from the Pacific. Now, I'll say one thing, the Jap pilots were smart. When we were in the task group, they come out of the sun, and they come down, and we fired like hang at them. What they do is run between the ships. Mm -hmm. So we're shooting at each other, yeah. believe it or not. <coughs> There's the chemicals, he's it. splattered all over us. Okay. Yeah, we get that one out. I'll show you what I look like on Liberty at Wacky Key Beach. But we did have Liberty. <laughs> so that was taken in Hawaii yeah. in what, 44? Yeah. Okay. Got it. And it took me a few years before I got those pictures. They, they shut them off on us. They, uh, or the security or whatever held them up. I got one of me being up on Diamond Head. <laughs> they didn't like that too well. If I can find it, I probably can't. Now, when you left the service, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? No, I didn't, to be honest with you. How about the 5220 Club? Uh, a few weeks. Mm -hmm. I was able to get a job, and I've worked all my life. I made a mistake. I should have finished school, high school, but I didn't. Let me get a picture of, of you in uniform, that big picture in front. This? Yep. That, that was one the Marine Corps had made. 
when was that taken? Was that taken at Paris Island or? Okay, got it. Did you, uh, have you joined any veterans organizations at oh, all? yes. VFW. I'm the longest member they have left now. Uh, I was still in the service. I come home and I was going with this girl. I took her out Monday night. I had a five-day leave. I took her out Tuesday night. Fine. I was going to take her out Wednesday night, and her father said, No, you ain't taking her out tonight. You're going with me. And I was sworn into the VFW. I was still in the service, and for two and a half years, they paid my dues. <laughs> so I have that number of years. Now, did you end up marrying her? Yes, I did. <laughs> but we had trouble. Oh. Yeah, that's the way life goes. Mm -hmm. I have a great son. We had a daughter, and that was part of the trouble. We lost the daughter. That's life. So I raised my son, and now he's the pride and joy of my life. I'll get some of your pictures that fell on the floor. Okay, come. How, um, how do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? It made me hot-headed, I think. I don't like to be pushed around. Probably telling you things that nobody else ever heard. But yeah. I don't regret it. That one bit. I'm glad I could serve my country. My ancestors all and my mother's side served my country, this country. Believe it or not. He was one of the first permanent settlers of this city. Really? Alexander Bryan. The old Bryan Inn is the second homestead. Hmm. And that's part of my family. And if you walk down the hall, you'll see their, my grandfather and grandmother's picture, my great-grandfather and grandmother's pictures hanging there. <laughs> that and 50 cents don't buy me a soda anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's the best I can tell you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview.